All right, well, welcome to another City Current webinar. I'm Andrew Bartolotta, Director of Digital Media for City Current. Today's topic is how to make tough investment decisions in wild markets with Duncan Williams Asset Management. So our presenters today are David Scully, President and Chief Investment Officer, and Hudson Atkins, Vice President at Duncan Williams Asset Management. So uh, thank you both for sharing today and helping us understand the current climate. As we get started, if any attendees have questions, you're encouraged to put them in the Q&A or chat box, and we'll open up for questions after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand for you to share with friends, families, and coworkers who are unable to join us live. So now I will turn it over to the DWAM duo to get us started. Great, hey, Andrew. Uh, thanks for having us. We appreciate being here today, but our partnership with City Current in general, you guys always do great work, and so uh, certainly Glad to be a part of it. Uh, for everybody that's on today, uh, thank you also for joining us. Uh, there has uh, been a lot going on in the investment world in the last uh, three or four months. And so um, we're excited to cover it. Before we jump into really what's been going on and, and how we might adjust, just want to tell you a little bit about Duncan Williams Asset Management, if you guys are all familiar with us. Uh, but for those that are not, uh, we are a, a 100% locally owned, uh, Memphis-based, uh, full-service investment advisory firm. Um, our mission statement is to serve our clients and to improve our community. Um, we, we take those uh, charges seriously, and um, basically when our company does well, we try hard to recycle the, the good work and the profitability and back into our community and to um, support the people that work here. And that's something that we always are focused on, but particularly in, in recent times, it seems like something that's been pushed right to the top of our list of priorities. And so uh, that, that will be a, a kind of a backdrop or a, a, an overarching piece to, to everything that we talk about today is, is how we view our role in the community here in Memphis. Um, uh, as Andrew said, I'm David Scully. I'm the President Chief Investment Officer at Duncan Williams Asset Management. Uh, my background is primarily in research and investments. And so I'm gonna to touch a little bit more on that as we're going through. Uh, but before we get back to me, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Hudson Atkins. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hudson Atkins again, and uh, thanks to Andrew and the City Current team and uh, really to David uh, leading us into this. Uh, it's been a, a wild ride uh, for sure. And a few things that we're gonna talk about today is really what, what's happened in this first quarter and how did we get here? You know, where do we see ourselves going? Um, and then really get into more of this, you know, what does that mean for me, right? Human nature is generally people uh, become panicked when there's so much red out there and, and panic is okay. We just need to make sure our emotions stay in check. And really how does this, you know, impact our, you know, next steps and moving forward. Um, just as Andrew mentioned, uh, if you have questions, please make sure to put them in the chat and we'll run through this presentation and, and make sure we get to any and all questions that we can do in the time. All right, so probably uh, the most obvious, or definitely the most obvious event that has caused all of the uh, panic and market sell-off is COVID-19, uh, a pandemic that started in a few provinces in China, originally thought to be pneumonia. Obviously, we've learned that it is a novel coronavirus and continue to spread and spread and spread. Uh, We've seen a, a few good bits of news over the last uh, few days, really last week, um, with maybe the plateau coming in, some of those more broadly hit areas. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. You know, ultimately, again, if you're five years old or you know, 95 years old, you understand this. Uh, it, it's, it, there's no way that this doesn't impact anyone out there. Uh, it, it's very clear, it's on the news, it's everywhere, you know, any talking head um, is covering this in some form or capacity, so it's, it's hard to get away from it. And uh, this is clearly the front runner for what's impacting uh, markets. It's not the only thing, right? Uh, one thing that we've also, uh, you know, including with uh, oil and gas out there is demand and also production. So one thing that we uh, noted in early March, uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and really OPEC end negotiations on the 8th. Uh, markets drop overnight by about 30% and we continue to see uh, essentially not only is there a lack of demand for oil uh, just due to really the global economy slowing down, there is also uh, an increase in output from Saudi Arabia. And there's also 
um, you know, really no, no future discussions held until uh, early this week. On the 13th, OPEC finally agreed to a daily production cut of nine and three quarter million barrels of oil a day. Uh, we'll see where that ends up. Uh, there is more to come on that, uh, I believe. Um, so again, not only do we have the coronavirus, which leads into lack of demand for oil, but also a, uh, a lack of a production cut, which really impacted several, several uh, very large companies. So if we look at, uh, this is gonna be kind of small, but this are, are these are the uh, 50 worst performing S&P 500 stocks in the first quarter of 2020. So some of these names that you'll see, uh, not only you'll, you'll notice in that far right column, uh, the quarter to date return or the quarter return, but also how much of that came in March. The number one, or the, I guess the top loser was Apache Energy, and it lost 83% in March alone. Now keep in mind, these are not just your you know, small cap companies. These are, these are in the S&P 500 with you know, multiple billions of uh, market cap. And as you continue to move down this list, you'll notice that uh, most of the top 10 are very large oil producers um, or in the energy space. You've got Marathon Oil down 75% in the quarter, Noble Energy down 75, um, Halliburton down 70, Diamondback, and you continue down the list and you're gonna be familiar uh, with several of these, all the way down to Schlumberger, which was down 60, 66% just in the first quarter alone. Uh, so again, this is the, how, did, how did the worst sectors fail? Energy, and then also some of the Dow transports. If you look at the cruise lines, uh, they were very hard hit in this as well. They're also in that top 10. And then um, you'll also find a few uh, consumer discretionary names as well as uh, some real estate and financials in there. But ultimately this oil market um, really took its heavy hit on several of these large uh, oil producers and uh, really contributed to a further exacerbation of that decline in the first quarter. Next is really the uncertainty, right? So we have all of the uh, uncertainty around oil. We have all the uncertainty around uh, COVID and what happens in, in different scenarios. Uh, but ultimately, again, when, when will the economy open up? When will oil uh, demand pick back up? Uh, we believe it will, right? Just like I believe that I'll be you know, driving to and from work once I get out of work from home. I believe the majority of Americans will go back to uh, you know, getting on, on airlines, right? I think there's gonna be a, uh, you know, a demand for just about everything. A few things will change, but ultimately demand will come back. We just don't know exactly when and where um, that will be and how it's going to exhibit itself. So one thing we were gonna talk about uh, earlier was have we ever seen a pandemic? Uh, we have, we just haven't seen one uh, quite like COVID. Uh, we have seen several uh, recently, and then um, obviously we can go back to you know, one of the uh, largest that we've really ever seen was in 1918, the Spanish flu uh, infected about, uh, I believe it was close to 500 million people. Uh, it, it ended up killing anywhere from 15 to 50 million. Um, but we haven't seen anything as far as recently, uh, anything near that, thankfully. Um, but you've had everything from recently, Zika, West African Ebola, you know, H1N1, uh, we've seen several, several, several uh, different pandemics. Um, but again, the difference here is that uh, the economic impact is uh, much greater from the more recent, uh, you know, true viruses that have spread. So secondarily, uh, just like we said uh, with the markets before, or pandemics before, have we seen anything like this uh, shock to the market? Uh, yes, we've seen, you know, sudden drops in anywhere from Black Monday, where we were down 44%, um, the dot-com bubble, uh, which ended up dropping the NASDAQ by 78, uh, and the Great Recession, right? The most recent form of drop that we've seen uh, where we were down 54%. And while those were obviously very large drops, uh, they didn't happen in just the span of about three weeks. And that was the speed that uh, when the government basically um, slowed down our economy, really contributed to a uh, very, very, very quick and steep drop. And that's, I believe, where a lot of this uh, panic that we'll talk about later, you know, came from. Um, and then where we see, you know, more certainty coming back into, you know, helping us, uh, you know, get through this. So uh, from everything we've talked about, we are in uncharted waters, right? So what does that mean? Well, right now we're, we're 
uh, essentially just going through the safer at home practice, right? Let's make sure we continue doing that. Uh, make sure we continue to practice social distancing because there are signs that this is working, right? We've seen, uh, again, information out of New York that we are plateauing. Uh, we are seeing a net hospitalizations um, decline rapidly. So we do know that it's working. Uh, we just don't know how quickly we're going to be able to get out of this from a uh, economic perspective. And uh, with this, I'm going to turn it over to David, uh, really, who's going to run through our behavioral biases series, and he will answer uh, really some things that, you know, from a, a behavioral economic theory perspective, you know, how do I, how do I react to these markets and, and what's best for me and my investment decisions? That's right. Um, so you guys will see here the, the first slide of this, and it says it's introducing our series. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole series. If you wanted to get online and dig around on uh, the, the DWAM website, you'll see we've got somewhere between 20 and 25 articles um, on behavioral finance and behavioral bi biases, uh, how our human nature impacts our investment decisions. For today, we kind of picked and cho chose the uh, handful, four or five, that we thought people might be struggling with the most um, in the current environment. So the first one here is uh, cognitive dissonance. Right, so you guys can see the definition here. It's basically um, when, when you've got two competing thoughts in your own mind, right? So the example here in the real world is smoking, right? So uh, most smokers are aware that uh, smoking causes cancer. And so they, on one hand, they like smoking. On the other hand, they don't like cancer. And so how do they have these competing thoughts in their mind rectify themselves? And sometimes they try to put smoking. Other times they try to um, downplay their own risk of cancer for genetic reasons or whatever, but but ultimately something's got to give there. They'll have this um, inherent conflict. They'll smoke and they'll feel bad about it, or uh, or they'll stop smoking and they'll um, feel bad about it, right? And, and so how that manifests itself in the investment world is uh, an example might be uh, holding a, a losing position, right? Where um, you made an investment in a, a fund or uh, an individual equity it's down significantly and you continue to hold it, right? Because on the one hand, you, you, you got a pretty good handle on it now, but like this probably wasn't a good investment. But on the other hand, like if I sell it now, I'm selling at a big loss and, and I don't want to do that. And so how do these competing thoughts um, actually work with each other? And even further than that is the idea that you hear people call it throwing good money after bad, you've got this bad investment. And rather than, um, rather than decide to move on and say, well, you know, if you liked it at 100, you'll love it at 25, and so you're gonna buy more. And, and ultimately, in many cases, that's probably not the right thing to do, and it's not your fault, it's human nature. And so it's just something that, that as people become more aware of it and they think of it um, in, in more realistic terms, it's something that they can, they can work to try to um, create a structure of discipline where they can identify these competing thoughts and, and uh, Make rational decisions uh, based on what the what the best um, what the best outcomes might be. Our second bias is the illusion of control, and so um, maybe the easiest way to explain this one is just to, to use the example in the real world. Uh, for any of you that might play the lottery, um, if you go to get your Powerball numbers. Uh, do you feel better about it if you choose your own numbers based on your birthday and your high school jersey number and your shoe size and uh, your anniversary? Or if they give you the randomly generated numbers, right? Like rationally, you know that one doesn't have a better chance of winning than the other, but you're still like given the opportunity, you're still going to pick your own numbers because that gives you the illusion of control. You don't actually have control over it. On the, the investment world um, example here, is actually an over-concentration in individual positions, right? Where people um, somewhat irrationally uh, feel that the, the fate of their, their, their investment is in some way tied to them. You see it a lot with individual positions where um, maybe you're not an executive at General Motors, but you really like General Motors for some reason. You like, you like the commercials. I mean, it just something that's a little bit irrational. So you say, okay, well, I'm like, I like that, so I'm gonna do that without actually doing any real research. And so because you have this emotional connection to um, your investment, it ends up being 
too large of a, a percentage of the portfolio. Today, we're seeing that uh, with people making emotional investments in companies that, um, that, they, that they like, specifically with doing either very little or no research. And, and that's, that's where you get in trouble um, because you don't actually have any control. Um, but, but you're taking a position as if you do, right? It's, this, this is different theoretically, right? You have to register and report because it's heavily regulated. If you are a, a key executive at a publicly traded company, because you do have control over it, right? If, if, uh, if Fred Smith wants to take a big position at FedEx, um, that's not something that, that, that I think we would argue with because he's got a pretty good handle on what's going on at FedEx. I mean, he has to adhere to all the rules about what he discloses and those types of things and so trading and all that. But, um, but, but that's different than, than most of the, the rest of us walking around making our investment decisions. Third one we're gonna talk about, and forgive me for the graphic for, for those of you that this might be particularly painful for, is uh, outcome bias, right? This is, this is the idea of uh, process versus results, right? And so I'm sure you all have a friend or family member, maybe a coworker that has filled out their March Madness bracket based on mascots or colors or the physical attractiveness of the coach. I know I've got a friend who has done such and has, um, has won the pool even with this kind of faulty decision-making process. Um, that's, that's crazy. I mean, that was just for fun or maybe just for a little bit of money. And so no big deal in the grand scheme of things. Um, and it's kind of a fun real world example. But, um, but in the real world, um, this is a, a bias that can really hurt people's investment decision-making process, right? And so if they have, if they have experienced good results while employing a, poor process, they might um, get anchored to that and say, well, okay, I'm going to continue to use this process because early on I had good results with it. Um, we'll see that not just with an individual making investment decisions for themselves, but we also see that in the evaluation of investment managers, right? If, if you, a um, uh, real world example is if you go back to 2008, there were a handful of funds, equity funds, that really held up well, right? Like the, um, you know, Hudson said peak to trough down 54%, but over the course of 2008, markets were down about, about 38%. And there were a handful of funds that held up really well. They're down 10%. They just crushed uh, on a relative basis because they were invested uh, with uh, some specific religious beliefs. They adhered to sh Sharia law. And so they invested in no companies that um, engaged in usury. And so they were completely void of financials. And so if you owned no financials in 2008, um, you had a portfolio that did really well. And so investors that piled into these funds um, because they have had great performance. And so um, the results are awesome, right? But the, but the process uh, maybe wouldn't. And so um, it's just really important when we get to a time like this where you've had pretty extreme results over the past three months um, that you're not just looking at well, who held up well in March and that's where I'm putting all my money. Um, there's there's got to be a, a, another level or two of research to make sure that the process we're employing to choose our investments is, is a good one. Next bias is recency bias. Um, this one is, like, I guess as we go through the biases, we're getting the ones that are even more and more relevant. Um, it, the example here is if you guys have ever been to Barbecue Fest, and uh, somebody brings out their, um, their ribs, their barbecue, and people start eating it. And inevitably, every, every, not just every time, every year, but every day that I've been to Barbecue Fest, someone declares, these are the best ribs I've ever had. And look, maybe, like, maybe they are, but realistically, they're probably not, right? Like you've had ribs 500 times in your life, and th these ribs are literally the best. I'll tell you, if you're standing in the Shy Town Cooker's tent, you're, you're either suffering from extreme recency bias or you're lying to us because we're we are there to party, not to cook. Um, but like this, this also uh, has an application in the investment world, right? And so uh, people tend to forget about how good the markets were when they're bad. And, and conversely, they tend to forget about what a bear market feels like when they've been, uh, when markets have been running up for, for years on end. And so, uh, today, 
Um, you know, if we gave the same presentation three months ago, we'd be talking about, look, you know, things have been great for 10 years. And like you, you bring it to a point where you don't remember the pain of 2008. Well, now we've flipped that, right? And so uh, we're, we're three months into something that's probably been pretty painful. And people are looking at us saying, my goodness, I, like I've got to stop the bleeding and I'm, I'm ready to pull out of the market and stuff my money under the mattress um, because they, they're tired of experiencing the pain. They don't, they don't remember how good it felt to make all the money in the last 10 years. All they remember is uh, how horrible it's felt over the past um, 10 weeks. And, and so it's you, like, you gotta be very careful. That really is probably the bad, it's probably the wrong call, right? If you wanted to go to cash and you missed your opportunity, we should have done that in, in January. And if you knew about doing that in January, I wish you would call me. Uh, um, but but realistically, if you, if you switch to a very conservative portfolio right now, because you're concerned about what your recent performance has been, you're opening yourself up to a whipsaw, right? Where you caught all of the downside. And then the market starts to rebound, but you're like, you're not going to catch on the upside because you got more conservative. Whether you went to all cash, whether you became more conservative, either way. Um, and, and I know that Hudson will, will talk about this in a minute, so I don't want to steal all this thunder. But, um, you know, if, if from an investment standpoint, if nothing has changed relative to your time horizon, your investment objectives, your risk tolerance, the things that you were taking under consideration when you were building your portfolio, then you, you really probably shouldn't be making drastic changes to your portfolio based on what happened over the past couple of months. So the final one here is loss aversion. Um, this, is a, this is always an interesting one to me, right? This is like, you, you get the college professors involved in this. There's actually, um, a professor that uh, has done some recent interviews, and then I came across one, uh, Daniel Kahneman. And so he teaches this class in, um, in his college, and he'll pick out a student, or maybe all the students, and they get to write it down. And he says, I'm going to flip a coin, and if you you'll call it, and if you lose, um, you're going to have to give me $10. Um, for you to play, how much money would I have to give you if you win? And, uh, you know, the answer should be, $10 and one cents, I'll have a, I mean, it should be like, a, you know, like, hey, hey uh, Professor Kahneman, how many times are we going to do this? If it's a million, then how about, you know, if, if I lose, you get $10, if I win, I get $10 and a penny. What they usually settle on is $20. And so you're like, oh, okay, college gets small money. He's gotten to, to the point, though, where he's, he interviews every executives and he'll say, you know, we're going to flip a coin and if, uh, if you call it correctly, or if, I, if you call it incorrectly, you've got to give me $10,000. How much will it take for you to uh, to collect if you if you get it right? And the answer is twenty thousand dollars. And so, uh, realistically, our our uh, our aversion to loss causes us to leave a lot of money on the table, right? You should be willing to take way less than than twenty dollars or twenty thousand dollars here, just to, if you you know, if you were able to play this game enough. But that's that's our human nature. We we hate losing even more than we enjoy winning. And so like some of the great athletes of, of all time are driven by this, right? Um, you, know, you can find articles by anybody. Um, I, mean, I saw one earlier today as I was getting ready for this presentation where uh, Lance, Lance Armstrong talking, I know not a great example because he's you know, he be the greatest cheater of all time, but he was cheating because he was so driven by the fear of loss. He just did not want to, he hated losing so much. And what did he enjoy winning? was just he could not stand to lose. So that's, that's what pushed him. And, and human nature, maybe not to that extreme, but uh, for everybody, that's how we feel now. And in an investment portfolio, an example is uh, maybe, like, let's pretend you go back, uh, you know, maybe two or three years ago, and you sat down, you came up with a full financial plan, and you built a portfolio of uh, uh, blue chip diversified stocks, and uh, you kind of sold out a bunch of stuff, and you built this thing, you had a good plan, it's been performing well. Uh, but you got one stock from five years ago that your brother-in-law recommended, and you've got a big loss in it, and it really doesn't fit into your portfolio, uh, but you're still holding it, right? And it's, it's part of this is human nature, uh, because as soon as you sell it, now you're realizing that loss, and, and you don't want to do that, and like you probably should. And so um, one of the challenges that we ask people to think about when we have a position like this occasionally called the overnight challenge and so uh, pretend that you go to sleep tonight and when you woke up the next morning, that brother-in-law stock has been sold and you have cash. 
Don't worry about the transaction costs. Don't worry about the realized angel losses. If you just had cash in that amount, would you buy the same stock back? And the answer is almost always no. And so we, we challenge people to think about their portfolio uh, from if we had, if we were making investment decisions from scratch today, how much would our current portfolio differ from what our future portfolio might look like? And that helps a lot with some of this loss aversion stuff. Uh, but with that, I think those, those are the five, um, five of these behavioral finance issues that we wanted to highlight. Like I said, if, if these were interesting to you, we've got a bunch of articles on this and we'd be happy to talk to, to anybody that wanted us to um, shoot us an email and give a, give a call on those. They're all pretty interesting and, and make you think differently about how you think, which is a, a funny thing to sell. But with that, let me kick back to Hudson and talk about uh, if, we, if we know that our human nature Draw, drives us to make sometimes incorrect investment decisions. What should we do next, given what the, the background and the, and the landscape has been in the investment world recently? Thanks, David. Uh, so ultimately what we're gonna cover is, you know, what's next from a personal standpoint and then from a market standpoint. So uh, what's next, what you should be doing right now? Um, you know, obviously uh, there's a few things that, that we've talked about earlier about, from a health standpoint, but financially, and what really uh, financial well-being, what should I be you know, looking at first? Um, consider building an emergency fund, right? We, every time we go through a, a downturn or, or a market correction or recession, uh, we, our goal is to make sure that we can have you know long-term dollars remain long-term, right? We don't tap our 401k. Uh, unless absolutely necessary to get us through. Uh, now, what that looks like is essentially three to six months of living expenses that we're able to put away into a savings account and really just don't touch, right? So that way, if we do go through, um, well, we will go through another recession. Uh, but ultimately, again, that looks uh, uh, we're not having to sell out at the bottom of our 401ks or IRAs or taxable accounts in order to fund our um, you know, well-being. The next, uh, and this is maybe a difficult uh, piece, but dust off your resume, right? I, I, I hate seeing people, you know, um, furloughed or losing their jobs, but one thing to, uh, you know, think about is make sure that you have uh, a resume that's ready to, to send out if you are to fall into that circumstance. Again, I hope we've seen the last of our job losses, but at the same point, it's uh, always a good thing to keep that uh, fairly up to date so that you're not spending time, you know, updating it when you need to be sending it out. Next, um, you know, again, assuming you had good investments going into uh, this black swan event, stay with it, right? We, now is not the time, just like David said, uh, you know, behaviorally, uh, from an investment standpoint, there's lots of different uh, ways the emotions or our emotions play with us, but stay the course, right? We well, developed a plan. Uh, hopefully, again, you, you picked and selected good investments going into this. They're going to come out on the other side, right? Just like we hit on earlier, we've seen uh, pandemics before, we've seen market recessions uh, before, and one thing we want to do is make sure we don't make a rash decision in this. Uh, panicking is natural, but at the same point, let's just not let that panic drive our thought process and make sure that we, um, you know, uh, lead us to make a, a poor decision uh, from an investment standpoint. Another thing is to revisit your financial plan and timeline, right? A lot of this, if you, again, if you had a, a, a strong financial plan, strong investment portfolio going into this event, hopefully you're, you're coming out on the other side uh, on the same, same trajectory, right? A lot, of, uh, a lot of our practice is trying to make sure that we have a goal-based approach. So if you have that goal and you can even go through storms like this and then come out and you're, you're hitting your goal still, it allows you to weather these storms much better, right? We don't want to, um, you know, invest for a short term and not have a goal-based approach to it, just like we don't want to invest for a long term without a goal-based approach to it. So revisit that financial plan, make sure you're, you know, checking all the boxes continuously there, keep your deferrals going, keep your contributions going to, to accounts and make sure that you're, um, again, staying in line with uh, what your requirements were to make sure you hit those uh, timelines and, and you know, risk objectives. Last is talk to a financial advisor, right? Uh, we'd love to talk to you, but, but ultimately that's what they're there for, right? So sit down, give them a call, you know, make sure that your portfolio is doing well, you're in check given the market uh, and just you know, run through everything. It's, uh, it's very helpful to um, you know, see them as a teacher and really almost as a psychologist during times like this, but 
ultimately that's what they're there for. Reach out to them. Um, you know, even if they are work from home or whatnot, there's plenty of ways to get a hold of people. Um, and so one thing is just to bring that, uh, bring that relationship closer in times like this. So make sure you're, you're staying in touch, make sure you're again, doing all of the uh, necessary steps to take advantage of times like this and uh, keep your, keep your emotions out of it and try to make sure that you, you go back to basics with what you should be doing. The second piece of this, and this is a little bit, you know, hopefully we can get some comic relief here. Uh, this is the cycle of the market we via emoji style. Um, so what we see historically in every market cycle is essentially everybody gets really excited about making money, right? So in the last few years, uh, the market has been up uh, pretty strongly. And again, it was essentially just put money in and it's going to make money, right? There was no... Uh, people didn't believe there was any financial risk, right? We got complacent with everything. Uh, well, it's, I think David touched on this earlier, but it's hard to think that we've gone through anxiety, denial, fear, and panic, and anger, and depression in the last uh, really 30 or 40 days, um, but it's possible, right? We don't know if we've seen the bottom yet or not, but we're going through, again, a lot of this fear, and it's, if we hit this low and we do decide to uh, get angry or depressed with our portfolios and sell it and put it under a mattress, which is the wrong thing to do, then that's really when we um, hit our, our maximum loss, right? If we decide to stay invested uh, or get invested at this point, point of maximum financial opportunity is generally when people are angry and depressed about uh, the overall marketplace. Then we see it begin to repeat itself, right? We get hopeful, we start to see some signs of relief, and then we get optimistic and run through the entire market cycle again. Uh, again, this is not a um, you know tried and true. Uh, it's not you're going to see just the bottom like we saw a few weeks ago, and then come through this, and that's just you know off on the races again. Uh, it's just something that you can generally see through every market cycle. These are the emotions that you get hit with. Uh, it's very normal. Like I said earlier, um, you know panic is a real thing. So is anger and depression. Let's just let not let those drive our investment decisions, right? Let's bring everything back to our financial plan, our financial goal and make sure that we're you know, looking through this and we're gonna come out of it. We just don't know exactly when that's going to be. And ultimately, um, you know, if we can rely on a, a history to be our guide on for the most of it, then we're gonna be in, in a fine spot. And that's essentially it. Um, I know it was a fire hose of data and information. Um, look forward to answering a few questions here. I think uh, Andrew may have our chat uh, filled up, I think. Andrew, yeah, right? yeah, I have a few yeah. questions that people have uh, submitted, so we'll start those. Uh, someone asked, which industries do you expect to bounce back or perform stronger in the coming year? Real estate, travel, oil? Yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, it, it's obviously very difficult to predict, uh, you know, what, what sectors will be performing best, uh, which is why we want to stay diversified. I, um, you know, one thing, I, I think the biggest part of that is not trying to chase some of this, um, you know, go, I call it bottom fishing, right? So just because we see Apache energy down 83%, um, it's not going to bounce back 200% in a month, right? We're not going to see a lot of those names come back as, as fast as they've fallen down. So I think the, the biggest sections that I, you know, or that we look at are strong balance sheets in this. Let's weather the storm and get through it. Um, I, I think that's the, the bigger opportunity out there as opposed to trying to track down some of the red. Um, again, strong balance sheets, regardless of the sector, uh, and then trying to avoid, um, you know, the big deep discounts, whether that's a cruise line, an airline, financials. Um, if we can, again, there's probably some opportunity there we just don't know what the debt restructuring or, you know, how they're going to get saved and, and bailed out through this and what that's going to look like. So um, I think a good goal is to not try to pick the right sectors, but avoid and, and not get sucked into trying to find all these deep values. Cause there's a reason why they're down that much, right? There's global oil demand is, is, you know, it, it basically as low as it's ever been. Uh, we've also seen uh, oil pricing, oil pricing drop substantially. Um, and even with the cut, we've seen oil basically sit flat this week. So I don't want us to, um, again, try to find those deep discounts or deep values that, that may not come back. Great answer. So uh, would you recommend investing while stock prices are low? Yes. I mean, plain and simple, I think so. I mean, if we, again, I, I think investing is key to really 
um, you know, it, again, let's make sure we get a savings account that's got those three to six months of, of living expenses in it. Um, but ultimately, I think investing is a very, very uh, successful way to continue to build your wealth. Uh, I, I, I liked investing in December. I liked it in January and February. I like it in March, right? That's obviously very difficult uh, to stomach those market swings. But at the same point, as long as you weren't investing for March 23rd, or March 31st, um, you're going to get through it and you're going to come out in a, in a good spot. Uh, history being our guide there, right? We don't want to try to get, um, you know, fancy with it. Uh, but no, I think that's a, it's a great time to, to, to be invested. Just make sure you understand where your risks are and your risk tolerances um, and make sure those are aligned with your goals. Yeah. And that's why financial advisors are so important. Like y'all, um, we, if someone else has a question, if I have a 401k through my company, but, um, Duncan Williams asset management, isn't the manager, can I still work with you? And if so, do you have any investment minimums? Yeah, um, good question. Um, and so uh, actually we won't get on when, um, when, when Duncan Williams asset management was first and seventh, even prior to that, um, when we were the private client group inside of Duncan Williams Inc., um, Duncan and his advisors wanted to create an organization that could be a full service investment advisory firm for the city of Memphis. And that's not exclusive to the city of Memphis millionaires. And with that in mind, we very intentionally have no, uh, no minimum on any of our investment accounts. And, and so uh, additionally, while I know uh, folks at Lipscomb Fitz um, feel us and touch us and, and see us the most as it relates to retirement plan, uh, actually about 80% of our accounts and about 60% of our total business is working with individuals. And so to answer that question uh, directly, yes, not if, if anybody has any questions, uh, there's no minimum. There's, um, and frankly, there's no, uh, there's no consultation fee um, in all times, but, in, but particularly in this time, uh, we feel that our role, uh, consistent with our mission statement, which is to serve our clients, improve our community, is to be there for the people of Memphis. And so to the extent that people have uh, fears or anxiety or questions about investments, uh, regardless of, of the balance of their accounts, uh, we want to be here to answer those questions. So yes, we'd, we'd love to, to have conversations with anybody that are interested. Now, if uh, here's another question. If I worked at two other larger companies uh, in the Mid-South in the past and had um, my retirement or investments in there, What's the best way to see where they are at currently if you haven't had access to them for some time? So uh, from an old 401k perspective, uh, there's generally what's called a record keeper. And that record keeper will be holding the assets. They're gonna be sending statements out. They're also gonna be um, you know, providing online access. So if you worked at uh, XYZ and the record keeper happened to be Fidelity, Fidelity would be the place to go to find you know, really where your account is, how it's invested. Uh, we've run across that uh, several times. It's one thing that we really work closely with people on is trying to figure out and track down, you know, past 401k balances, whether it's a, you know, $1,000 or $100,000, it's still your dollar, it's still your money, right? And it's working for you, you know, make sure it continues to work efficiently. Um, there's also a, a lot of uh, complexity with making sure it stays in the right place, whether that's a, a fee standpoint, um, an investment standpoint, um, or how it's really going to ben benefit your financial plan. So uh, before you go through with doing a rollover, um, there's, a, again, a lot of different moving parts to that. Uh, but that the, to answer the question, I guess, specifically is the record keeper from the previous company will have all the answers, right? So you're going to run into a lot of names you're familiar with, like a Fidelity, a John Hancock, uh, Empower, um, T. Rowe Price, a lot of those bigger, bigger companies uh, occupy that space. And that's where you should uh, begin to start in that space. Great. Thank you. And um, please tell our viewers again where they can reach out to you if they have any questions or want to uh, work with y'all. Sure. Yeah, um, we're, we're, uh, should be all over social media. We've got a, a Facebook page, a Twitter account, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, our website is DW assetmgmt.com. And uh, if you want to reach out through our main line, our, our phone number is 901-435-4250. Great. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Hudson. We appreciate it. We hope that 
Um, this is sort of uh, ending as this uncertain uncertainty folds unfolds, um, and we appreciate you joining us today, as well as everyone viewing. Uh, this will be on on demand as well, so make sure to follow Duncan Williams Asset Management social media accounts, as well as City Currents Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, all of those uh, social media. Uh, accounts and uh, we look forward to um, seeing you all in person soon uh, hopefully it's sooner than later and thank you for joining us yeah thanks everybody really appreciate your time and please stay safe throughout you know the rest of this um, you know safer at home let us know if you have any questions and don't hesitate to reach out to us yeah, thank all you right. for having us appreciate everybody thank you have a great day everyone